On this edition of Mississippi Roads, we're all about the dead, or the final resting places of the dead, that is. We'll visit Cedar Hill Cemetery in Vicksburg, one of the country's oldest and largest cemeteries that's still in use today. And we'll travel down Highway 61 to Natchez to hear stories from that city's historic cemetery. Then we'll head up to Columbus, where our National Memorial Day holiday has its roots. We'll also visit the grave of Henry Vick at the Chapel of the Cross in Madison County. Support for the arts segment of Mississippi Roads comes from the Mississippi Arts Commission, whose mission is to be a catalyst for the arts and creativity in Mississippi. Information available at www.arts.ms.gov. Mississippi Roads is made possible in part by the generous support of viewers like you. Thank you. Down Mississippi Roads. Hi, welcome back to Mississippi Roads. I'm your host, Walt Grayson. We're in Cedar Hill Cemetery in Vicksburg this week. Cedar Hill Cemetery is truly hallowed ground. It very adequately reflects the beauty and the complexity of the storied city of Vicksburg. There's 20 to 25,000 souls interred here, and some of them with birth dates all the way back into the 1700s. Given Vicksburg's pivotal role in the Civil War, there's a special section called Soldiers' Rest, where about 5,000 Confederate soldiers were buried, most of whom died of wounds or sickness during the Siege of Vicksburg in 1863. The Union soldiers are, of course, just up the road at the National Cemetery. There's at least one very unusual marker here. It commemorates the service of Old Douglas, the dromedary. That's right, a Civil War camel right here in Mississippi. Douglas was originally part of the Camel Experiment, a national program started in the 1850s where camels were brought across the ocean to see if they could prove more helpful than horses and mules in settling the West. Well, the program fell apart when the Civil War started, and some of the camels were seized by Confederate soldiers at the start of the war. Well, old Douglas ended up here in Vicksburg, and during the siege in 1863, he was killed, supposedly by a Union sharpshooter. And Douglas had initially wreaked havoc with soldiers and horses alike because of his overwhelming stench and bad temper. But eventually he became the much loved unofficial mascot of the 43rd Regiment and his loss was greatly mourned. Hence this marker lovingly placed among the remains of other soldiers who perished here. There's another cemetery here in Mississippi that has a close connection to war or maybe I should say wars, but it, it's not what you think. The cemetery is appropriately called Friendship Cemetery, and it's in Columbus. And the connection is this is where our National Memorial Day holiday has its roots. And those roots are in an unselfish gesture of reconciliation demonstrated one day by one of the ladies there in Columbus. And her kind gesture was caught up and went viral for its day nationwide, back before the days of Facebook and Twitter were ever thought of. Well, the first grave site here is from the 1840s. Uh, the cemetery is on the National Register of Historic Places, and there's a soldier from every war from the War of 1812 through the Bosnian conflict buried here. And there are generals and colonels and privates, as well as mayors and judges and congressmen, and even a speaker of the House of Representatives of the bygone day buried here, plus about 10,000 other folks. The Odd Fellows started the cemetery. The city of Columbus owns it today. There's a Jewish section here, a baby section, and there's one little grave site that says Orphan Annie. The Civil War is well represented here. One man who was at Fort Sumter at the beginning and with Joseph Johnston, the last major Confederate force to surrender, is buried here. Stephen D. Lee, who was a graduate of the Military Academy at West Point and a distant cousin of Robert E. Lee, is buried here. Uh, Stephen D. Lee, uh, was following the orders and the commands for the first shots to be fired at Fort Sumter, which of course did begin the Civil War. He was instrumental in the establishment of the Department of Archives and History for the state of Mississippi, for Vicksburg Military Park, and of course was the first president of Mississippi State University. 
Probably the most popular marker in Friendship Cemetery in Columbus is the Weeping Angel at the Teasdale plot. Even Reverend Teasdale has a Civil War connection because he knew both President Lincoln and President Davis, and taking advantage of that was sent as the head of a delegation that needed permission of both men to sell cotton, to raise money to build an orphanage. Both men signed the petition to allow such an endeavor. Oh, they say that the Weeping Angel is the most photographed of many of the monuments throughout the South, not just in Columbus. Reverend Teasdale was the pastor at First Baptist Church, and when he died, um, people were grieving all across the nation, and he had once lived in Massachusetts. And the people there asked for permission to build the monument in his memory, and they were given that uh, privilege by the people at First Baptist Church of Columbus. And when the monument came, it was a weeping angel, they said, because when Reverend Teasdale died, even the angels cried. He was known for having the only document signed by both uh, Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis. Also buried here are hundreds, if not thousands, of Civil War soldiers. A little odd in that there were no battles fought in Columbus. The closest battle fought here was the Battle of Shiloh, and the soldiers were uh, loaded up on the rail, on the train, and they were brought here, and it was almost the end of the stop. You know, they, they came here, they opened the doors, and literally put the soldiers out. Many did receive their health back. And then, of course, there were many that were buried here. At first, there were soldiers from both the Union and the Confederate armies who were buried at Friendship Cemetery. After the war, the Union soldiers were reinterred at the National Cemetery at Corinth. The war ended in April of 1865. Then a year later, in April of 1866, when the spring flowers were once again blooming, a group of Columbus ladies came to the cemetery to decorate the graves of the Confederates with fresh flowers. But one young mother couldn't stop there. And they got here and one of the ladies said, I'm a mother, I can't do this. And they said, what do you mean? And she said, you know, I'm a widow, I'm a mother of a soldier, and all of these soldiers buried here are someone's son and someone's uh, brother, perhaps, someone's father. And in a spontaneous moment, they began placing flowers on not only the Confederate soldiers' graves, but the Union soldiers' graves as well. And it began to be known as the flowers that healed the nation. Horace Greeley published an account of the gesture of the Columbus ladies honoring the dead of both sides of the war in his New York Tribune. And soon, Decoration Days, as they became known, were being held everywhere. Decoration Day became a national movement. And as more wars were fought over the years and more of our soldiers were buried all over the country, the date was moved to the end of May when flowers would be blooming everywhere. And over time, the name was changed to Memorial Day. And here is where the animosity between the halves of our nation started to dissolve over these very graves a century and a half ago in Columbus, Mississippi, at that very first Memorial Day. You know, I've always thought the most interesting part of the headstone is that little dash between the dates. That's where everything happens in life, that little dash. All the heartaches, all the joys, right there. The most beautiful markers are often the most tragic in that they commemorate children, lives cut short by unnamed illnesses or accidents. We can't help but grieve for the parents and siblings left behind. Even after all these decades, the family sorrow is palpable in these intricately carved monuments to loss. So there's saints buried here, and also sinners. Take, for instance, Alexander McClung, also known as the Black Knight of the South. McClung had a reputation as a ladies' man, but also as a hard-drinking, homicidal miscreant who behaved like a character out of Gothic fiction, dressing from time to time in a flowing cape. He ultimately died by his own hand in 1855. I guess Tales of ghostly hauntings are expected when you're in a cemetery. And Cedar Hill Cemetery is no exception, like the one associated with this monument, placed here in 1911 for 22-year-old Estelle Brazier. Word has it that if you're here in the cemetery at midnight and touch these piano keys, music will start playing. 
We probably won't hang around long enough to test that today. All right, now we're going to head down the road to Natchez and visit another cemetery that's easily as steeped in just as much history and just as much lore as this one. We're going to look in the rearview mirror at a segment that first aired back in the year 2000. Well, it's part of life, dying is. Uh, nobody plans on it, nor expects it when it comes most times. Because I would not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me, is the way poet Emily Dickinson put it. But so far, departing this world has been just as sure as entering it, so it shouldn't surprise us. And to make the passing less painful, we've created cemeteries for our dead. Well, actually, they're not for the dead. The dead could care less. These places are for us, to lavish a little more love on a departed loved one, or propitiate guilt by putting into marble after death what wasn't given in life, or was misdirected until eternally too late. But whatever, the process of dying and grieving and honoring has left us places like this, Natchez City Cemetery, a city unto itself with mayors and generals and craftsmen and, well, everybody you need to make up your own town because a lot of the people who did make up the town of Natchez since 1822 are here. Well, June 4th, 1822 was when the first burial was made here, but there are people in here who died from even a few years before that. They were moved to City Cemetery from this place, the first burial grounds in Natchez. It's now the park just behind St. Mary's Church downtown. The remains they couldn't identify when they moved the cemetery are in a communal grave under the floor of the sanctuary. And it's not just Natchez folk buried here. On the Mississippi side of the river are tall, steep bluffs. But over there, on the Louisiana side, is a flat delta land, easily overrun by floods. So those from over there who could buried their dead over here above high water, like this person who spent their life in Concordia Parish, Louisiana, and is spending their death in Adams County, Mississippi. And even the namesake of the Delta, Louisiana, Don Jose Vidal, his town is over there across the river, but he's high and dry over here. Every stone has its tail, but there are some really interesting stories in here. This marker is a memorial to two doctors who came to Natchez in the early 1800s to study yellow fever. Both died. So Dr. Chu and Dr. Watkins are remembered by this marker, erected in their honor by the medical pioneers inscribed totally in Latin. Young Rosalie Beekman lived with her family in their home under the hill at the time of the Civil War. When the Union gunboat Essex was refused ice while out in the river from Natchez, the put-out Yankees showed their displeasure by shelling that area along the river. Little Rosalie caught a piece of shrapnel across the back of her leg while she was running away and bled to death. She's the only casualty of the Civil War in Natchez. Here marks the final resting place of a fallen woman from New Orleans who came to Natchez and plied her trade in the dark places along the riverfront under the hill. Only after her death was it realized that no one even knew her last name. Her first name and her life story mark her grave. Three little words, Louise the Unfortunate. Florence Irene Ford was just 10 years old when she died. The story goes she was afraid of storms, so after her death, every time one of our Mississippi afternoon thunderheads would start to build, one of her parents would open the heavy iron doors just behind her headstone and descend the brick steps they had installed there and set just this side of the window that allowed them to watch over her coffin until the storm passed. Uh, the window's been sealed over, but the steps are still there. There are over 10,000 significant pieces of marble statuary and monuments cataloged here in Natchez City Cemetery. Eudora Welty observed in her photo book of country church cemeteries that it's mostly in graveyards that you find works of art in Mississippi. And Natchez has its share, not only marble works, but ornate iron fences of every style and design, austere and foreboding to gentle and soothing to almost comical if this weren't a cemetery. I'm sure this corn meant something to the resident that it encloses. 
And Natchez City Cemetery is where century-old antique rose bushes can still be found, fragile and delicate. They've run away from the places where they were planted and visit all over the cemetery now. And I suppose maybe Edwin Lyon had this end in mind most of his working life, his own resting place. He was the craftsman who created many of the stone monuments in the cemetery. Then one day, he too was here. He created quite a beautiful neighborhood for his own final dwelling. But again, cemeteries are for us, the living, to go to and see loved ones or family members back several generations and to admire the works of art that surround them. Museum quality, some of this work. And we think how they must like being here. And we're comforted knowing that they are comfortable in and among and a part of all of this. And then we feel better about their having left us. And then we quickly leave before we begin to like this place too well ourselves. In the oldest section of Cedar Hill Cemetery here in Vicksburg, which by the way was initially plotted out back in 1837, there are many graves of immigrants, some coming from as far away as Germany and Italy and Ireland. No doubt they came to the great land of opportunity to see what the rich soils of the Mississippi Territory held for them. There are others whose names are still familiar in these parts. Take the Vick family, for example. Newt Vick was a Methodist minister, and the person for whom Vicksburg takes its name. He and his wife Elizabeth had 13 children, and many of their descendants are buried here. Now, the matriarch and patriarch of this Vick family are buried in a family plot just up the road. Tragically, they died within minutes of each other of yellow fever in 1819. Speaking of the Vick family, today we're going to revisit a story about one of Newt Vick's descendants, Henry Gray Vick. Uh, this story is set in Madison County, and in it, we also hear the haunting tale of the Bride of Annandale. Well, if these old headstones could talk, they could tell us lots of interesting stories about our past. To visit them, all you need to do is enter through the squeaky old wrought iron gate. But don't let the squeaking scare you, it's fine, just come on in. The handmade gate and the ornate old iron fence that surrounds the cemetery here at the Chapel of the Cross in Madison County serves to set the mood for the place. Now, some of these old headstones behind the chapel have even been here for a century and a half. Each of them are unique unto themselves, but there's one grave in particular that always seems to grab the most attention. It's that unusually large grave over there between the old magnolia tree and the back of the chapel. It's the grave of Henry Gray Vick. Henry Vick was the oldest son and heir to one of the largest plantations in Mississippi called Nittyuma. Henry was on his way back from Jackson when the wheel of his buggy broke, and he just happened to be crossing Annandale Plantation at the time, and took his wheel to Ingleside, the mansion there, to be repaired. When he knocked on the door, he was greeted by a beautiful young woman. Her name was Helen Johnstone, the daughter of the house. As it turned out, she was the belle of Mississippi and the most desirable, unattached woman in the state. Well, it was love at first sight. Henry visited with her for a while, and their friendship began to blossom. All too soon, his wheel was repaired, and he was on his way back to Vicklin, his home at Nittyuma Plantation. Despite the distance, all his thoughts from that day forward were of returning to Helen. The courtship spanned several years, as was the custom in those days, until Henry asked for her hand in marriage, and she accepted. The wedding was set for May 21, 1859. Now, that was also the date of Helen's 21st birthday. Surely it would be a very special day for all to remember. The bachelor party was held the weekend before the wedding at Vicklin, Henry's home along the banks of Deer Creek on the Nittyuma Plantation. 
all of his closest friends were there, including his best friend, Jane Stythe. It was after all the participants had left, with the exception of Jane Stythe, that a disagreement between Jane Stythe and Henry would occur that would tragically change the lives of everyone involved. You see, back in those days, honor wasn't an important thing. It was the only thing. Old Jake had been Henry's slave all of the young Mr. Vick's life. And old Jake had raised Henry from a young boy and taught him how to hunt, fish, and shoot so well that Henry was considered the best shot in the state. The relationship between old Jake and Henry was so strong, in fact, that old Jake was seen to be more like a father to Henry rather than a slave. It was often said that people would sometimes puzzle as to whether Henry Vick owned old Jake or did old Jake actually own Henry Vick. James Stythe ordered old Jake to bring in his horse as the clouds outside Nittayuma had grown dark as an intense thunderstorm was forming on the horizon. And James Stythe, not wanting to get caught in the storm, was hurriedly packing his saddlebags. Stythe had planned to jump on his horse and ride as fast as he could the short distance to catch the steamboat at the Nittayuma landing without getting wet. As soon as old Jake had brought Stythe's horse to the hitching rail outside the house, he abruptly ordered old Jake to go fetch his saddlebags. So old Jake did what he was told, but in his haste, he didn't have time to tell Mr. Stythe that the horse had not been cinched. And while old Jake was inside, Stythe attempted to mount the horse. As a result, both he and the saddle fell to the ground in a cloud of dust. At that moment, old Jake came running out of the house with the saddlebags and realized what had just happened. By this time, James Stythe was furious. As he dusted himself off, he cursed at old Jake and threatened to beat him. I ought to have you beat! James Stythe then stomped back into the house, threw open Henry's door, and demanded that Henry beat old Jake. Henry said all that was hurt was James' pride, and he wasn't about to beat old Jake. James Stythe became even more infuriated and took great offense toward Henry. He claimed that Henry was holding the honor of a slave over his. At that point, James Stythe coldly stared at Henry and with a loud voice told Henry that if he ever saw him again, there would be trouble. Well, the next day, Henry rode over to Annandale to meet with Helen. He was picking up the final list of items they needed for the wedding and then would go from there to New Orleans to pick them up. Once he arrived at Annandale, he told her about the incident at the bachelor party. And Helen made him promise never to kill a man. Despite his strong feelings about the matter, Henry gave his word of honor that he would obey her request. And with the list in hand, Henry rode over to Vicksburg, where he joined his friends as they took the boat to New Orleans. Well, once they arrived in New Orleans, Henry quickly acquired all the items he needed, and as they'd be waiting a few hours before the boat was finished loading, they decided to relax and play a game or two of billiards at a nearby tavern. As Henry was chalking his cue, a shadow of a figure filled the doorway. It was James Stythe. Henry's friends, not aware of what had occurred between the two of them, called Stythe over for a drink. The voice came from the darkness and said, I will not drink with a man who has no honor. As Henry was about to speak, James Stythe quickly moved toward Henry and slapped his gloves across Henry's face. It was a direct affront to Henry's honor, and Stythe followed the insult by challenging Henry to a duel. And of course, Henry being a man of honor, could not refuse. In 1859, dueling had been outlawed in New Orleans, so it was decided they would duel at the racetrack in Mobile, Alabama. Early the next morning, the two of them arrived at the fairgrounds. The weapons chosen were Kentucky long rifles at a distance of 30 feet. On the count of three, they would fire. So on the count of one, Henry pointed his rifle into the air and fired. Henry had hoped that Stythe would understand that he meant him no harm, but Stythe didn't. He took aim and fired. The bullet ricocheted off Henry's rifle barrel and hit Henry in the temple, killing him instantly. The seconds brought Henry's body back to Nidayuma. Henry's father, Colonel Henry Vick, immediately sent old Jake to Annandale with a note for Margaret Johnstone. In it, he told of Henry's death and asked that Henry be buried at the Chapel of the Cross. So it was shortly before midnight on May 20th, 1859, as the church bell at the Chapel of the Cross began to ring, that Henry's body was lowered into his grave during a torchlit ceremony. For Helen, 
That was to have been the happiest day of her life. And yet it became the saddest. The bride-to-be, in turn, would spend the rest of her life wishing for what might have been. I'll leave you now with some of the sights and sounds of Cedar Hill Cemetery in Vicksburg. And that's it for today's show. If you'd like any information about anything you've seen here, contact us at mpbonline.org slash Mississippi Roads or join our Mississippi Public Broadcasting Facebook page. Till next time, I'm Walt Grayson, and I'll be seeing you on Mississippi Roads. made possible in part by the generous support of viewers like you. Thank you.